Children's. All right. We're going to try to build some floating shells out of this stuff. It looks rough, and it is rough. Some really old oak. Uh, old oak. Some more redneck, bro. Just get over the accent. So what I got is uh, these little floating shelf brackets from Rockwell. So you got a piece that goes into your stud on the wall, and then a piece that goes into the shelf. So I'd like to make these about six inches wide or deep, um, and about three feet long. And they need to be at least at least about you know four and a half inches deep to fit onto this, but I think six inches will be good. This is mostly just gonna be for like picture frames and stuff. So this is part of a larger build for a fireplace round and, and we'll, we'll do the fireplace too, but we're gonna start with these. Now, uh, most of these are about an inch and an eighth, so they're just under five quarter. So then we're gonna have to mill these a lot, but hopefully there's, we can mill it um, and get down to a good surface, get rid of some of the cupping and still have enough left to mortise to fit the thickness of this and have it covered Maybe about five eighths of an inch. I think we should be good. Let me make sure this one is five eighths. This one's probably more like three quarter. Yeah. All right, got a lot of work ahead of us kids. Um, I think first I'm going to cut these down to length so they're easier to deal with. And then, uh, yeah, we'll cut them down to length and then we'll take them to the joiner over there to get at least one straight edge, rip them down the saw, maybe joint some of the faces before we put them to the planer. Let's do it. One more thing before we do this jointing. So, I might just be making this up. I know for sure you want the cup down, right? I also like to orient the grain because I feel like I get more tear out. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So, when we're talking about cupping, you see how... Uh, Let me just put this on the tripod. This is going to be way easier. Why, why didn't I do that in the beginning? All right, so we're, we're talking about cupping. You can see that there is a little curve here, you know, so that it's more concave in the middle. And you want this down on the planer blade so you're not wobbling all over the place. Another thing that I like to do is to look at the orientation of the grain. Now, this one's got some pretty straight grain on it. So it shouldn't catch and tear out as much. And again, I might be making this up. But my experience, when you've got some grain patterns, like this one, for instance, if you feed this angle, see how the grain is kind of swooping down at an angle? If you feed that in towards a direction that the blade is cutting, so if it's spinning and cutting in this way, I, I, I've noticed that that tears out more. So I will generally try to face it uh, the opposite direction. Now I'm going to feed it in this way versus towards the blade so we're not catching these edges here. And I usually will make little marks on these, um, like down here. So I got an arrow towards my cup. I got an arrow pointing in the direction that I want to feed this wood into the joiner. I don't know if any of that makes sense. It's just something I do. All right, so I said we're going to do a side. You want to joint the face down first. Then maybe plane it. Use that flat face against the fence of the joiner to joint down at least one good square edge, which you can use later to rip down the other side. 
These aren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but we got the cup out of most of them. So now we're going to plane them down. So we'll run the, uh, obviously the rough face up and the face we just joined, it'll be down. Hopefully just take very little off of these um, and then we'll cut them down to width. So you're going to see that I'm feeding these through kind of alternating. I also use a waste board to feed in front of my first board and behind of my last board because my planer is not that well tuned and it tends to snipe out the end of the boards pretty badly. Uh, so it's just an effort to, to keep that from happening or reduce it. You don't have to do that if you got a well tuned planer. They're not all going to do that, but I've gotten snipe on about all the ones that I've used to some degree. So uh, sometimes I'll make my stock longer than necessary so I can cut the snot parts off as well. But you can always just run the waste board through and then alternate your stock if you've got multiple cuts. We've got some relatively flat faces, consistent thickness. Now we're going to joint down one edge. So we're going to find an edge that's got a little bit of a cup in it too. Same way we do with the face and this one's got a cup in it. That's the edge we're going to joint. In this instance, now that we've got good flat faces, we're going to keep one of the faces up against our fence here. And I've already uh, squared that out with a base. So when we run this through, we're cutting a, an edge that's, uh, or a side, that's pretty well squared with the face. And then we'll just rip down the other side of the table saw. I don't really care about having, you know, S4S lumber for random shelves. Let's uh, fix these here. Now we can joint down the sides. You can see here my fence was really not one to cooperate, but now that you got a good flat face, you can use that flat face against the fence of the joiner to get a really good square edge, at least on one side. And then that's really useful to put against the fence of your saw for ripping these down to a good consistent width. After a little bit of a sanding marathon, we got all eight of these pretty well cleaned up and milled down. So we got a mortise uh, back side of these so that we can fit the thickness and width of these two plates together in there. So the biggest one is just a little over 5 eighths wide in this dimension. So we need a mortise that wide. Now, first, my idea was to use a hollow chisel mortiser, but the biggest bit I have is a half inch, and that's going to take a long time. So, I think what we'll do, because I'm going to put some quarter inch strips of oak along the sides here that are about an inch and a half wide to give this some depth, make them look a little thicker. So, it doesn't really matter if this corner is clean. We can cut right through. So, we'll set up the uh, dado blades and we can get these to the exact thickness that we want. Run it through once should be good. A router is another option. I just don't trust the tear out on a router uh, to try to route these out. Um, probably tear the hell out of it. And it's just as easy for me to set the dado up and run this along the fence and get it done way quicker than a hollow chisel mortiser. It's a cool tool, but I think I've used it once in the last four or five years, so it's get, definitely got its uh, its place. It's not one I use real often. You're going to see right here where I created a ton of more work for myself. And these boards, even after I was careful about how much I planned off of them, were just too thin. So you can see here as I started to do this dado cut, I'm basically ripping off all of the bottom. So I had to rip down some thinner pieces of oak to glue onto this so that this is covered and then there's a little bit of bearing surface. If I had used thicker stock this wouldn't be a problem but I didn't have thicker stock laying around and I wasn't going to go buy thicker boards for this purpose. Make sure you give yourself plenty of room 
when you're milling lumber down because a lot of times with this old stuff you're going to end up taking off way more than you assume you're going to to get everything good and flat and level and square. All right, so we got our mortises. I put a little piece of oak on the bottom to give some, uh, I don't know, some strength and a little more bearing surface. We're wrapping it in these little thin pieces of oak, just cutting these at 45s and gluing them on. I'm gonna spare you that process because this sucks. I mean, it really does. But once this is done, all we gotta do is sand it down and put a, put a little stain on. I know some of you out there are really into glue-ups. I don't know why. This is terrible. It's tedious. It takes forever. It's like being really into folding laundry. You need counseling. You need to talk to somebody. This is not right. When it comes to stain, it's pretty straightforward. I like stain. You just got to rub it on. You, know, you want to pay attention that you're just not rubbing in random directions. Rub it with the grain or brush it on with the grain. And then let it dry a few minutes. You know, the can says 5 to 15. And it all just kind of depends on how dark you want this to be. And every wood's going to kind of soak this up differently. So... Honestly, with these, I probably only waited a couple of minutes, probably not even five minutes before I wiped off the excess with a dry cloth. Now, another thing, when you're done with these cloths, do not wad them up and throw them in your trash can. Lay them outside on some gravel or concrete, or if you've got a metal can for oil rags, you can do that. But as this cures, these things can get very hot, and they will definitely start a fire if you leave a big pile of these, these oil-stained rags. Lay them outside and let them dry before you throw them away. Well, we got one coat of this gun stock stain on there. And I was going to put some poly on there. We'll see what the uh, see what the homeowner wants. But I kind of like the way they look now. They're not terribly matte. And they're not blindingly shiny. Which is kind of what I wanted. And, you know, there's... Some rough spots on these, but these are shelves. They're going to be hanging on the wall. We've already put in 
way more labor on these things than I ever anticipated. And, I mean, it's handmade oak shelves. You can't really put a price on that, right? I don't know. Anyway, here we are. I think we're good as far as these are concerned. We'll see what they think about the poly. Um, and we got this stack over here we got to turn into a fireplace around. Well, there you have it, kids. Um, talk to the homeowner. We're not going to do the poly. We'll just leave them like this. Um, I would like to catch the process of drilling the holes and mounting these on the wall. And if I can, I will. Because it's going to be a first for me. But these aren't going to my house. You know, and I'm not going to just intrude on somebody's home with a camera while I install these. But if they're cool with it, I'll show the process for that too in another video.